Hi, my name's Matt DiNapoli. Uh, I work for DevNet in the DevNet zone. Um, welcome to Intro to API Security. Uh, <laughs> we've been doing a lot of, or we've done a lot of classes uh, for, in, with regards to APIs. And uh, for about a year and a half or so, we didn't have one that talked about actually accessing the APIs. Uh, we just showed people how to use them and just assumed that they would figure out the, what I would argue is the hardest part of that. So I, was, I took it upon myself and I said, hey, we need to get people this data so they at least understand um, what they're up against and how to, how to figure out how to access these uh, APIs uh, that we talk so joyously about. So that's what we're going to cover here today. <clears throat> So uh, that was my introduction, so we did that already. Uh, we have authentication versus authorization. There is a very distinct difference, and I will tell you what that is. Stay tuned. Um, and then I'm going to get into different types of uh, authentication or authorization, depending on what you're talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll cover what's called basic. Uh, that one's pretty easy. That's why it's basic. And then we have token authentication, also very easy. Um, and then we get into OAuth, which is quite secure. Well. There are some problems to it. But it's secure, more secure than basic and token. Uh, but it is a little bit of a challenge to get to work. Uh, and you'll see why. So <laughs> API security. Or I ain't afraid of no data breach. Uh, AB, APIs are access to data. That's what they are in a nutshell. Um, if you guys came to my 101 class this morning, we saw a bunch of API calls where I got a bunch of data back. Most of the data that we asked for was public information. That's all fine and good. Um, whenever I was making the calls to Spark, though, I was dealing with one particular user. Now, you can imagine a scenario where um, someone might be able to benefit from getting access to someone's uh, Spark account, whether that be find messages that could be incriminating or find out if you're using Spark to talk about um, uh, sensitive data. That might be useful to someone who has malice on their minds. And so uh, we need to make sure that those APIs, in, in, in addition to the applications, are secure. Um, so that's a good reason. The APIs themselves um, create a lot of open, uh, potential openings uh, for security breach. Um, it allows you to get data, obviously. It allows you to add and change data, which could be potentially damaging. And <clears throat> Uh, it also allows people to delete data through the APIs, which could, um, in some instances, bring businesses crumbling down if you delete their data. So we want to make sure those things are secure uh, so that we don't run into these problems. Um, and APIs use resources. So um, I'm sure you guys have heard of DDoS attacks. You all network engineers, right? <laughs> and so whenever an API call is made, it's hitting a server. It's, uh, it's taking up bandwidth. And so if someone is uh, consistently using an API and not getting shut out, um, that could cause that service to go down if, if the load's too high. So we want to make sure that, um, that we're controlling that environment. So that's why these particular security methods are in place. Um, I mentioned that we would have a, a discussion about authentication versus uh, authorization. So authentication is saying, I am me, right? Um, that is. When you go into a service, you log in, it pulls your name back, it pulls your email address, it ties you to that login. That's, that's authentication. Authorization, on the other hand, is I'm allowed to do something. So I work for Cisco. When I log into Cisco systems, I'm allowed to do different things that you, who aren't Cisco employees, or maybe you are, um, but if you aren't, you aren't allowed to do. That's authorization. And I can do that across multiple uh, sites that are managed within Cisco. And that then uh, jumps into the next part, which is federation. Uh, federation says, I'm authorized to do things here. And um, if I'm going to another site or using a new API or something to that effect, then um, I'm also trusted over here. And that could be through passing a token. That could be through uh, cookie settings, something to that effect. So that's federation. And then uh, federation and delegation go together, which is basically saying, um, I logged into this service. Um, and, and I say I, I, it could be a person or it could be an application. In this instance, we're talking about APIs, so it's like most likely a system to system discussion. Um, the application is logged into a service, um, and it's saying, this service is saying, I don't care what's going on over here. If you're authorized to use this, 
and you're authorized to do this. So that's just delegating the, the service, one service to another. So federation and delegation go together. <clears throat> All right. Can you read that comic or is that too far away? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to read it to you because I think it's funny. It's uh, email account set up to verify your identity. We need to ask you a question nobody else could answer. And the question is, where are the bodies buried? And he starts the answer, behind the, and then he stops. <laughs> and he says, behind the, nice try. And then the cops are on the other side saying, huh, you know, oh, we almost got him. <laughs> so um, the first method we're going to talk about is the basic authentication and authorization. And I call it authentication and authorization because it does both those steps at the same time. Um, what it requires is that the application um, in question that's making the service call have a previous user ID set up on the service. So that means um, that an administrator in some point has set up um, login credentials specifically for that application on that service. Um, there are potentially two ways to do it. They both kind of go together. Uh, the first thing is that the service um, or the application asks the service or tells the service I'm making an API request. It could potentially come back and say, I need a valid username and password. And then the application sends it. And if everything's cool, the service will send that information back that it's being asked for. Now, uh, it's called basic uh, because it is um, a base64 encoded string that is uh, comprised of the username colon, and then password. Um, and we'll see that example in a second. Um, or you can parcel it all together, make the API call, and send that basic authorization in the header. That's that second part that we have at the bottom there. Um, hey, service, I'm making an API request. Here's my, here are my credentials. All right, cool. We're all good. Here's your data back. So <clears throat> I'm going to actually leverage. Um, I do a CMX talk like every day, it feels like. Um, I'm going to leverage our uh, Mobility Services API uh, to show you guys just real quickly how BASIC works. So one second. We're going to hop over to my Postman client. Um, so for those of you uninitiated, uh, this is Postman. Postman is, sorry, stop looking at that. That's for later. That was a peek into the behind the curtain. Um, the, this is a, a REST client. It allows us to test out APIs without having to write code, make sure that uh, we're understanding the information that's coming back, how to form the URLs, what parameters to pass. Um, so in this instance, I'm going to show you guys how basic authentication, or basic authentication works. So <clears throat> um, I want to call this API to get the map information back for a specific area that I've set up in CMX. If you're not familiar with CMX, it's the location services uh, service provided our offering from Cisco, uh, basically uh, tracking devices in a Wi-Fi space. Okay, um, so you can imagine that I might need the map for some reason to be able to lay that out so that I can put these dots on a map. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make that API call to get the map. The most important thing in doing this is that I want to do authorization because if I make the API, API call without any authorization, we'll just run it. Oh, it didn't update my header. <laughs> that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> well, that's letting me without it. Let's try a different API call. <laughs> One second there. I'm going to try the Active Clients API. Uh, API location v2 clients. <clears throat> oh, that's letting me do it too. We have a bug in our system. <laughs> um, apparently, you're able to call the APIs without uh, authorization, which is unfortunate. Um, but anyways, had this worked, <laughs> you, I would have gotten a 401 unauthorized error saying I'm not allowed to make that API call. <laughs> we will see that when we look at the, um, the second portion of the token. Uh, but anyways, 
if this was working properly. Um, there might be something in the cache that I'm running into, so we can try that out later. But let's just assume that that, that wasn't working. Um, actually, actually let's, this is an invalid one. Let's see if it does it with, OK, there we go. Uh, I think there was something in the cache there. So this isn't a valid user on that, on that service. And so uh, because I'm sending a basic auth string that is not configured, um, in the authorization, or so th this is the, the authorization header. We notice we have, it's called basic, and then this encoded string that's generated from the username and password that I put in in this space, okay? Um, so that one doesn't work. It tells me 401 error while authenticating, um, which means that user's not allowed. Now I know I'm an admin on that box, so I know that there is a valid user where the username is learning and the password is learning. <coughs> Make this a little smaller. I lose all my buttons when I, when I blow it up. One second here. There we go. <laughs> All right, I've lost the ability to scroll in here. So one sec, I'm going to reload this. The uh, trials and tribulations of making the screen bigger so people can see. OK, cool. <laughs> uh, let's try this again. I'm gonna, I do need to make it bigger because I know you guys can't see that. I just don't want to make it too big. Um, so if I go to authorization again, I need to make sure that I'm uh, setting that properly. Uh, it doesn't automatically update in Postman. Uh, that's a common mistake people make. Um, I made it probably a thousand times. Um, uh, you make sure you want to hit update request. And then we see our header change to a different string value. Um, it's encoding that for us. We don't have to worry about doing that ourselves. A lot of packages in uh, different coding languages um, already have a basic package in it. So you usually don't have to worry about doing the encoding yourself. Um, it's a pretty well, well understood standard, something that um, you know everyone has used in the past. So, and it's old. So now this works. Okay, good. That's what we expected. A okay. Any questions on that? Basic is basic for a reason. It's pretty easy to understand. So I've set up that user on that system to allow myself to do that. Now, there is an extension to that that we call token ticket whatever you want to call it. Those are interchangeable terms. We're going to look at the APIC, AP, uh, APIC EM APIs um, to demonstrate this particular method. But basically, you're sending in some manner, depending on how the API is defined, um, username and password or some kind of credential that identifies um, either the person or the uh, application as itself. And again, similar to the previous situation with BASIC, that username and password is pre-set up. But there's an extra handoff. Um, so when you make that initial request, you're asking for a token to come back. And then any API call after that will be leveraging that token. You're not going to send your credentials over, uh, over the wire anymore. You're just going to send that token. And there's a little bit of added security because you can set up expiration on that token. You can set rate limits on that token. Um, so it's, it's a little more secure. But it's not, um, it's not that secure. So we'll, we'll try that out with APIC EM APIs. Um, so essentially, the <coughs> application makes a request and says, hey, here are my credentials. Send me a token. Service comes back and says, cool, here's your token, ticket, whatever you want to call it, back. All right, I'm going to start making API calls with it. And then every time that service is going to validate that token until it, until it expires. So let's go back to Postman. And like I noted, um, it doesn't really matter what API we use as long as it supports this method. I know that this one in particular does. It's um, our APIC EM um, API. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, show you guys what happens when I don't have any authentication. And I know this won't work because uh, I set it up that way. So it's telling me that the ticket is not recognized. Um, so I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I needed to get a ticket. What do I do? Um, so I look in the documentation, and the documentation tells me that I need to set, actually, let's, 
do it without a, t a, a, a ticket. The first way would be, I don't know, I, I needed a ticket. I don't know how to authorize. It tells me that I failed to provide a CAS service ticket to validate. So that's the first error I should see. <clears throat> now I'm like, OK, I, have a I think I have a service ticket. I'm not sure how to generate it. Is this the right one? No, that one's not recognized. It's invalid. Or you used it before, and now it's expired. So now I'm, I, I want to generate a new ticket. And all I'm doing is making an API call to get a list of hosts from the APIC EM. So what we need to do is, let's see here. Let me make sure I get the right API call. When I look in the documentation for APIC-EM, and I could show you this, but I want to get to OAuth, and that's a little complicated. Um, I'm going to pop this open. Um, the documentation tells me that the API that I need to call is um, apic-em slash api v1 ticket. And that'll give me a ticket, but I need to do a post into it. And then it also tells me that to do that, I need to send in my credentials. So that's that credential portion that we're going to send in to um, generate our ticket. So if you look at the body, um, it's already set up there. I know that that username, devnet user, and the password, cisco123, bang is already set up in this service and should be valid and generate a, a, a ticket for me. OK? All pretty straightforward and makes sense, right? Any questions? If you have questions, just raise your hand. My colleague Paul will run over to you with a microphone. OK. He's the mic guy. So assuming they didn't delete my user in the last 45 minutes, sweet. I have a new ticket. So if I'm writing an application, that first step that I'm going to do is create, uh, call that API to create a ticket. I'm going to parse out the, the response and grab the, my string ticket. And I'm going to use that over and over and over again until it tells me I'm not allowed to use it. Now, we saw that we had this particular header. It's called XAuth token. Again, the documentation, I keep coming back to that. The documentation is the thing that's telling us that I need to set that particular header. Um, I don't think XAuth token is, or it might be a, a standard header. I don't really care. All I know is the documentation says to me, for you to be able to make a, a valid API call and get the response back, that's the header that you send, and it's got to be a valid ticket. So I have a valid ticket now. That's great. Let's pop it in there and see what happens. <coughs> In the world of live demos, you never know. So we get a response back, as expected. Cool, great. So we get our list of hosts, their host Mac, the connected network device ID. Awesome. That's just what we expected. Cool. Now, if again, if I had a typo in there or I didn't have a valid ticket, it should give me, again, that ticket not recognized. So it's not good. So cool. And then, oh, the other thing about that, again, we see that 401. 401 unauthorized error. So <clears throat> for writing application, I mentioned this in 101. You want to handle those status codes. 200 is OK. It's always OK. Um, and then uh, oh, I just thought of a cool idea for a t-shirt. It would just say, always 200. Like, I'm always OK. Um, so anyways, uh, 401 is unauthorized. You're not allowed to do that. And that's a standard code in um, HTTP responses. So. That took up about 18 minutes. The rest, stick with me. <laughs> OAuth isn't as challenging as it seems. Have you guys heard of OAuth hands? OK. Are you familiar with it? Or you just sit there and you go, I've heard of it. I don't really know what goes on behind the scenes. Is that cool? OK. The behind the scenes stuff, it's not as bad as it sounds. But um, I'm going to leverage Cisco Spark, because that's our product that leverages OAuth that I know about. <laughs> Um, and we'll, we'll get into that. So uh, let's see here. Um, a, a quick discussion about OAuth. Excuse me. So uh, this is the, the one that's becoming the accepted standard. It's not actually uh, ratified as a standard. Um, but there is a very spe uh, it's actually not very specific. There are sets of instructions. Uh, there is a RFC for it. So it's um, it's getting to the point where it might be ratified. 
Um, there was an OAuth 1.0. We don't really spend time on it because um, people are moving away from it. Um, it was actually a lot more secure than OAuth 2, or arguably secure than OAuth 2. Um, but the amount of work needed by application developers and service providers to support OAuth 1.0 apparently was uh, challenging. So um, they were trying to make it easier. Uh, it actually has a number of different flavors to it that, um, that allow for different ways to uh, authorize users. And notice I didn't say authenticate, and I'll explain why. Um, it's not an authentication. There's no identity management in OAuth. That's left up to the um, provider. And there's a uh, part, as part of the discussion of the standard is OpenID Connect, or, um, and that, that could potentially hold the authorization. But it's not, or authentication, excuse me. That is not necessarily needed, though, to um, leverage OAuth 2. So, uh, it's a standardization of the token method, kind of. Um, but inherent to it is that federation and delegation that we talked about. So with the CMX service, if I, have a, if I have a user that's set up on that system, they can only access the CMX service. If I have a user set up on APIC EM, they can only access APIC EM. Yeah, you might set them up on different platforms, but you have to do that in two separate places. Those are two separate management systems that you have to worry about. With um, OAuth 2, it allows for a scenario where you might not even know as a application consumer where that particular uh, authentication is happening or authorization is happening. So for example, um, the, our learning labs. We're working on a process right now, where, um, and I wish we would have gotten it done for Berlin, but we didn't, uh, where we're implementing the ability to sign in with your Google, cred uh, Google cred credentials. Yeah, that got stuck in my throat. Um, your GitHub credentials, your Facebook credentials, and your Twitter credentials, and I think maybe even LinkedIn. So we're looking at this because we have accounts everywhere, <laughs> and it sucks every time you have to create a new account. Just in our own properties, you have a separate, um, a separate login for Spark than you do for DevNet, than you do for Tropo. And so we sit there and we scratch our heads and go, there's got to be a better way. So if all of those services support OAuth 2, then we can say, all right, <clears throat> for example, the learning labs, I can allow someone with a Cisco Spark credential, if I, if I set it up this way, to log into learning labs. And then I don't need to worry about whether or not they have a, uh, in, in this instance, we have them use Cisco.com credentials. So I can give people the opportunity to use any service that I deem respectable to authorize that person. Um, and, and that decision is made on the application side. So we can see then that the delegation is happening in the federation, because then you can imagine if you are uh, working on a scenario where you need to worry about single sign-on, you set up a, essentially a user broker service. They log into that service, and it kicks out to any, any process that's tied into, or any application that's tied into that service. So there's their, our, feder our federation. Now, there are two, I mentioned there are different flavors of OAuth 2. Uh, there's two-legged authorization. That's kind of like the token and the basic stuff that we saw before. Um, they, they put that in to make it easier in some instances where you don't have to worry about things. Um, the one that's used more often that you see is the um, three-legged authorization, though. That's when you log into something, and then it asks um, if Actually, Google does this a lot. It asks if you're allowed to authorize Google or authorize the service to use your Google credentials. Or if you log into something with Facebook, it says, do you authorize the service to use your Facebook credentials? Yes. OK. So um, the best intro to OAuth 2 that I've come across that, and actually poached the entire the, of the next few slides from there <laughs> is uh, at digitalocean.com. Um, I should have set up a WebEx. I apologize for that. If you want that link, we can talk afterwards. Um, or you can snap a picture. I'll step out of the way so you don't have my ugly mug in there. But um, that's a good one. And it, it, uh, if you're kind of just getting a taste of it from me and you want to read a little bit more about it, that's, it's very perfect. It takes about half hour to read, maybe. And um, really, it, that's, that one stuck with me. So I'll let you take a picture real quick while I take a drink of water. All right, 
Moving on. So we're going to see, as we walk through some of the diagrams of how OAuth 2 can work, um, different roles. And this is, I'm not kidding you, this is the most confusing part of OAuth 2, because they don't use terminology that I think is, um, like, I ha why do I have to define this stuff? Uh, but these are the terms that are used when talking about OAuth 2 and the specification. So when it says resource owner, that's the actual user. That's you sitting at your laptop trying to access something. Um, the client, on the other hand, is the application that you're logging into. Um, the authorization server could be anything. It could be that Facebook. It could be Google. Um, it could be even the service that you're um, logging into. It might have its own OAuth 2 server in there as well. And then the resource server is the thing you're trying to access. So those are our terms. Um, resource server makes sense. But the other three, I feel like they made unnecessarily complicated. So here's the general flow. Um, <laughs> you notice there's a lot more arrows than the other ones. Uh, we have uh, the application that's the client, could be your browser, making an authorization request to the user. That's when you get that screen that pops up that says, is this application allowed to use your Facebook credentials? Resource owner, you say yes, puts in your name and password, comes back, that's an authorization grant. You're saying this is OK. Then the application makes a request to the author, uh, authorization server saying, I've been given authorization to do this. Give me an access token. Here's your access token. Everything's cool. And then the application then uses that access token over and over again. And this um, could be, so in this instance that we're talking about, this would be APIs, uh, making API calls now. Um, take that access token and keep sending that over to the resource server every time we make an API call. So we see that it's more of a standard of a standardization of that token method. Um, the terms authorization, the terms access token, those are, those are part of the specification. And so um, you notice when we did the APIC-EM token method, they called it a ticket. Um, that was a choice. That's not really standardized. And so if you go from one service to another, you might run into those issues. Whereas this is a more of an accepted standard. Um, and then the resource server, if, every, if that access token's valid, um, it'll send back that uh, particular API response. Are there any questions on that? No? OK. OK. Um, so how do we get that application to be allowed to use your Facebook credentials or your Twitter credentials? You have to register that application with that service. You have to say to Twitter, I'm writing an application where I want people to be able to log in with their Twitter credentials. And Twitter has to say, OK, or Facebook has to say, OK. Um, so they do that client registration. And then <coughs> they're given a client ID and a secret. Uh, those are standard terms as well. It's client underscore ID, client underscore secret. Both of those are important because they are necessary to identify the client ID is uh, used to identify the application. And then the secret is used to keep everything secure because um, that's only provided once to an application provider. And then um, any time that it's needed again, it has to be regenerated. And so um, in any scenario where you're writing an application, Hopefully, you only have to set it up once, but if you've hard-coded it into your code, which I would never recommend doing, um, you would have to go into your code and update that again to re if it's, it has to be regenerated. Um, and then authorization grant uh, has four different types. So the one we're going to see and the one that I've actually seen, I'm trying to think if I've seen it. Oh, no, I've seen two, uh, two of them, um, is authorization code. That's the one that's used the most. Um, Implicit is used uh, against trusted resources. Um, and then resource owner, password, and credentials, um, that's kind of a way to get around it, this being a little bit harder to do than um, uh, basic authentication. And then I've never seen client credentials, and I actually haven't researched it very much, so I can't really speak to it. I don't think it's really anything you guys have to worry about right now. So um, the biggest one that we have to worry about is this author authorization code um, flow. So this is the one we're going to look at, authorization code flow. So uh, this is, you know, we saw that basic flow, but this is now the, uh, the specifics of it. It's, deri it's the derivative of that initial one. Uh, so we have the user, um, same person, the resource owner. Um, it makes a call through the user agent. Uh, in that instance, it's our web browser. 
um, makes that uh, authorization request. The user says, OK, I'm, you know, here are my username and password. You're allowed to use these credentials to authorize me to use the service. And the auth server sends that code grant back. Um, and then uh, requesting the access token, everything gets validated. And then the access token is sent back to the auth server. Um, now, uh, there is becoming a standard for that access token validation. Because you're probably saying, or how, well, how does the auth server know that that's valid? Is there a standard for that? Um, technically, no. Um, there, the, the specification itself kind of leaves it open to interpretation. So um, what is becoming more um, popular is what's called a JWT token. And uh, that stands for Java Web Token. Um, so that's a, it's a validation of the token itself to say to the authorization server, um, this, this is a, a valid token. This user, um, this application, everything in it is valid. Um, it's usually an encrypted, um, it's, it's a token that includes some encryption of data in it. And the authorization knows how to decrypt that on its side with some shared key and says, uh, pot uh, potentially, here's the username and password. Here's the email address of that user. Um, so it does actually potentially pass some of that um, authentication information in it, depending on the API. Um, but it doesn't guarantee that that's going to be the case. There might be a different validation method assigned on that side. And usually, there's a timestamp with it, because they keep those access tokens um, limited to a certain amount of time. So the uh, validation will happen on that auth server side, but it's left up to the provider of the service on how they want to implement that. Although there are many packages and tools that do a standard method of, of processing what are called JWT tokens. Uh, the implicit, uh, implicit code flow, um, this bypasses the, um, the authorization grant or authorization code. Um, it basically takes the client ID and it says, all right, I know that this is a valid application. Um, just let it through. That's why it says it's implicit. It's implicitly trusting that this application is allowed to um, access this service on behalf of this authorized user. So uh, we won't see that one. Um, Spark does not support it. Uh, so we're going to go back to the author authorization code version. Um, but I just wanted to mention it for your edification. So let's get into it. Hopefully everything will work. I kind of panicked a little bit because right before uh, my last session, I was trying this out to make sure that everything was OK. And something has changed, which I've yet to identify, but I found a workaround. Um, so the first thing that we want to look at is the documentation for Spark. Um, wow, that's small. <clears throat> One second, let me make this bigger. Uh, hold on. <clears throat> So I'm heading over to developer uh, dot Cisco Spark dot com. <clears throat> Are there any questions, by the way, so far? I think once you see it in action, it'll be able to wrap your head around how it works. Um, I'm logged in as one of my test users. Um, and then in the documentation, it tells me under in integrations how I should um, authenticate my applications. So I'm going to create an application. It's going to be Postman um, that will be able to make API calls then from it. And so this, this documentation tells me how to do that, tells me how the URL should be formed to get my authorization code, um, tells me what particular parameters I need to send. Um, it also tells me the scopes that I might set for that particular one. Um, and uh, it also will tell me what I need to do once I get my access token. Um, how do I then get my, uh, well, how do I get my access token once I get my authorization code? Excuse me. Uh, so uh, that's all of the, in the cool info there. Um, so I've already registered an application, so you don't have to watch me type. Let's load that up. I don't know why, but I named my test account Darla. I don't know who Darla is. I don't know any Darlas. Um, so there are a couple of different ways you can create an integration. Uh, to show the author authorization method, uh, we'd have to do with an integration. 
Uh, bots are given a, a specific access token that is assigned only to it. Um, so they don't actually go through the, the whole handshake methodology that I showed you before. They're just given access through. Um, so uh, we have a, oh, I don't want to do a new integration. I already did one. I'm going to click on Darla Spark app. Let that load. So we have the name, pretty straightforward, description, what it does, um, the support email, all that fun stuff. Um, <laughs> this is the most annoying part of setting up these uh, particular uh, applications. There's an app icon required, um, and you need, it needs to be specifically a, a, a 512 by 512 icon. And for some reason, it, it's not that easy. So I keep poaching my friend Adrian's uh, picture of a cat. So I use that. Now, <clears throat> because I'm using, I'm going to show you the API calls using Postman. Um, Postman is nice enough to give me the option of what the callback URL should be. Why? OK. Uh, let's see here. Make this a little bigger. So if I go into authorization and I drop this down, it gives me, we saw this before. This is when we use basic. If we go to OAuth 2 and I go get new access token, this is the part that doesn't work now, which is very frustrating. But I'm going to walk through the steps that this thing does. Um, but it says callback URL. If you're going to set this as the, if you're going to use this application to test, set this as the callback URL. So th thanks a lot, Postman. That's cool. Um, so we're going to set that as our callback URL since that's the application that I'm integrating. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, that's annoying. So uh, that's why we have that there. And then we have scopes. <clears throat> and this is essentially um, what is your application asking to do? And in this instance, I'm just going to set it to uh, being allowed to read a list of rooms. And so uh, that's fine. Uh, we did, didn't want to put a whole list in there. And we're going to save changes. I didn't make any. <clears throat> Whenever you create that, then it'll, it'll uh, generate a new, ah, it'll generate a new client ID for that particular app. The client ID does not change ever. Um, it will cause problems if that client ID changed. Uh, the client secret, however, uh, does. And so um, I'm not going to regenerate it because I have all the demo stuff set up already, but assume that I have a client secret. And the nice thing is um, they built out the URL for us and said, if you guys want to do the authorization code request, here's the URL for it. So let's grab that. And I'm just going to call it from my browser. Now, again, I don't know why the, um, the Postman integration isn't working. I haven't figured that out yet. That's why I panicked. Uh, but this works just as well. And I can actually show you very directly how that is generated. So y this is similar to what you would see. And I'll make this bigger. Um, similar to what you would see for if you were trying to log in with Facebook credentials, if you're trying to log in with Twitter credentials, you'd see this app is requesting. This is the authorization grant process, the list of titles in, in the rooms that you're in. And you say, I don't know what KMS is. It's an underlying thing. We'll just ignore it. Um, and so you can either say decline or accept. And I'm going to say accept. Now, man, that is small. I'm going to pop this up and show you guys what happened here. Um, what I should have, what I did miss, uh, because I'm, I'm already logged in as that user, um, it didn't prompt me for my credentials. Um, and I'm, I apologize for that. But um, imagine before we saw that ex the accept or decline portion, you were, you were prompted for your credentials. So I was already logged in. I apologize for that one. So if you're like, he didn't log in. How does it know? Uh, that's why. <laughs> so we'll do that. I'm going to show you guys this. Let's try notes. Can make notes bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to knock that out. Uh, I just want to show you the API, so you, or the um, URL, so you can see that. So what it did was it sent back to my callback URL <clears throat> a, a value called code. 
And through the instructions, I know that then I need to send that code into the access token URL to get my access token to make the API. So now we've finished the first handshake part. We're going to do the second handshake part. So let me grab this. All I want is that code. Thank you. And now, because of the documentation, I know that I need to do a post to um, get my access token. And I, hopefully, I did everything OK. And we can actually see through this API call that I've gotten a token back. So geez. Ah. One second. Jumping around in Windows and uh, demos, always a challenge. All right, let's try this again. <clears throat> so what I want to do is we can look at the parameters that I need to set. And I want to change this code to the one that I was just generated. Now, through the documentation, um, it tells me that I need to set that grant type to authorization underscore code. Um, it tells me that I need to put my client ID in. And it tells me that I need to put my client secret in. Um, and then the, the authorization code I was given. And then the redirect URI is actually very important. If it doesn't match exactly to the one that you uh, did the original call with, it will invalidate the request. So I have everything set. I think everything is good. Um, the only thing is, oh, the documentation also tells me I need to do a post to um, XWW form URL encoded. So it knows that the body of the post request is in the URL and not in some payload, JSON payload that we're looking for. So <clears throat> we hit send. Hopefully we get an access token. Yes. So now I have an access token. I can make API calls. This is then used to make an API call. Let's see here. We want uh, the rooms call. It was the one that we, uh, that we allowed. <clears throat> Let's see here. Rooms. So just to show you quickly, um, if I were to put in a typo or something like that, or a token that I hadn't generated, I get a 401 unauthorized, like we saw before with the the other API calls. But if I use um, the proper token that I've now gone through the handshake process of generating, then we should see the list of rooms that I'm in. And that access token is tied to the user. Um, and it's, it's validated on the Spark side, on the Spark's OAuth service, to that user. So I know, without sending any other information, that I should only be sending um, information back for Darla. And so that's how that works. So we did all of that. Anyone lost? Good. OK. That's excellent. So that's everything. <laughs> and ah, two minutes to go. Um, any questions? Nope. OK, excellent. So in theory, uh, you could leverage Spark to um, the Spark OAuth to uh, authorize people for your applications if you wanted to. <laughs> um, one admin thing uh, that I like to talk about. So uh, we have in the DevNet Zone a bunch of different things to do, workbenches, these sessions, learning labs. Um, they're all fun and cool, at least in our opinion. So we hope you think they're cool too. Uh, but you get credit for doing them. and. Um, we have a Spark app, or we have a Spark app. Cisco has a Spark app. Um, and we built a bot for it called Devi. And Devi uh, lets you play the game. And basically, it's, hey, I was here. I did this. I did that kind of stuff. There are instructions on those stanchions and at the info booth if you guys want to get credit for that. We're going out some fun stuff, uh, hats, socks, blankets, all that kind of fun gear. So uh, just want to mention that. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your day here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Mm-hmm. <laughs>